We are here with Millie Arbahe Thomas, who's the CEO of the METCO program. Millie, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Millie, can you give us a quick introduction to the METCO program, sort of who it serves now and where it came from? Sure. The METCO program is a school desegregation program that's voluntary in the state of Massachusetts. It started in 1966 here in Boston as a as, as one of the results of the civil rights movement where bo- people in Boston were fighting for more equitable educational opportunities and people in the suburbs wanted to um, have more students of color in their in their districts because they felt they were racially isolated. As a result of that, the Racial Imbalance Act was born in Massachusetts, making it illegal for Massachusetts to have segregated schools, and that's where the program actually was born. We have 33 communities right now in the city of Boston with 3,300 students participating in the program. The whole the point of the program is to reduce racial isolation in the suburbs. And so there are 3,300 students, K through 12, who live in the city of Boston, um, who get up in the morning, get on buses, and travel out to these 33 partner districts um, to get their public school education. Correct. Um, Exactly. And your family was, before you were the METCO CEO, your family was a METCO family. Your kids, um, can you tell us a little bit about your original involvement with the METCO program? Yes, I mean, one of the things that motivated me to be part of the METCO program when I learned about it, because when you, I didn't grow up in this in this country or even in Boston, so I found out about it through word of mouth, and I was told, you know, about the benefits of the program in terms of the all the extracurricular activities that it provides in the suburban communities, and I really wanted my children to have a, a number of opportunities to get involved in after school. My daughters love the school play. They love instruments. And those were things that I wanted to ensure that they received, but also the benefits of having that diversity that we bring into the table. I always remind my own daughters to don't forget to talk about who they are, who their families are, where we come from, when we visit our homeland, you know, what is that like? What is our language like? Never shy away from speaking, you know, the language that, you know, that that um, your mother speaks. And I think that there's a value to be able to bring that to a suburban district who is usually isolated from a diverse number of experiences as it relates to how kids are growing up. Um, I'm a parent there since kindergarten. My kids are in fifth and eighth grade in the MECO program, and when I actually signed up, I definitely did not know that I was going to end up in this role, but some of the work that I was doing in, in that community around equity work through my PTO, through my principal, through the school district, around celebrating differences and celebrating diversity were some of the things that motivated me to you know be in this role now, and how people approached me about this role was because of my involvement in my own school district. So you've been the CEO of METCO for 16 months now. Correct. Um, what do you feel like are some of the the most important strengths that the METCO program has right now? If you were to sort of point out some of the kind of shining examples of where METCO is really working at its best, what are some of the things that that, what, what are the ways that that looks like? I mean, I think one of the things that I see happening is the uh, the level of accountability that districts are trying to have with, their own, with themselves around really changing their practices, both in the classroom, in their hiring practices, in their discipline strategies. And one that's one of the things that we, even when I go out to speak to school, leadership and the school committee members, I let them know, or I ask of them, you know, if you are signing on to be a part of the MECO program year after year, it has to be more than just having students of color in the classroom. To me, it's no longer just the inclusion, but the welcoming environment. And that means what are you doing in all levels of your school to ensure that people of color are feeling are feeling like they're part of the school community. And, and when schools are not at that level yet, or, or when, when kids have experiences where they're included but not welcome, like what's the evidence for that for you? How would you, how would you be able to sort of diagnose like, okay, you've, you've let these students in, but they're not really being fully integrated into the community? Well, I mean, the evidence is that people, uh, that students and families say it themselves, you know? So, I mean, one of the things that's happening is that that, that the districts are truly committed to this work and they really want to do right by the program and they want all the benefits to come with the diversity um, in their classrooms. But they also, uh, you know, admit that there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of schools that are looking deeper into doing some restorative justice um, practice. They're looking into professional development for their teachers. They're being more intentional about the hiring that they do. But the reality is that there is a level of isolation that happens with um, in, within the program. We all know that part of a desegregation program, you're one of the few people that are commuting from another district in into that classroom. And sometimes you're just one out of two, or two people in the classroom that's a person of color. So that's going to always 
come with, you know, feeling isolated, maybe not feeling welcome. And, and it's very common sometimes for students to go through their whole life and still not have made a best friend in the district. Mm. So, you know, but we know that that's a problem and we're trying to find intentional practices to remind communities that now you have the program here, what else can we do to ensure that that welcoming piece is happening? But the parents and the students both have said that they don't feel like they belong sometimes. Yeah, no, I mean, that's powerful and that's tragic to have all this, eff- you know, there's so much effort that goes into bringing people in and recognizing that sort of getting students in the door in, you know, historically all white places is only the beginning of a process of integration, that it's really trying to figure out um, what what is it that would mean that we're not just, you know, allowing kids to be here but making space for them, but really making them an integral part of our community, you know, giving them all the ways to, the way that you describe with your own daughter, to bring their own backgrounds, their own strengths, their own assets and talents into the discussion and also have communities be really active in saying, we're so glad you're here and there's so much that you, we haven't even discovered yet what it is that you can bring, but we know that there's so much and we want to be able to tap into that and explore that. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So as you're working with districts, and it sounds like a lot of, it sounds like you're going to them and they're coming to you asking this question like, okay, what does the next level of work look like? How do we go from inclusion to welcoming? What are, what are the big categories that you're working on those schools with? What are the kinds of things that you're saying, um, okay, if you want to get to the next level of work, we need to be focusing on these kinds of areas. So a, a couple of things. One of the first things that I'm working on, it's just really trying to relive the, vi- the mission of the MECO program. A lot of people assume that they know what the program is, but they have a lot of misconceptions about the funding, about who the, who is supposed to serve. A lot of people think it's only for low-income students from the city of Boston, that it's only for black lo- low-income students, in that it's actually the district has to pick up all of the costs. So one of the first things that I'm doing right now is re-educating the, le- the, the leadership, the parents that live in the community, the school committee members that have, you know, this happened in, in the 60s, so there's been a lot of changes since then. First, I want people to understand why the program exists, why it came about to begin with, what is the purpose of a desegregation program, and what can your district do to become better at that? So the first thing for me has been education. Because in, in everywhere that I go, people think that they know what the MECO program is, but when I start breaking it down, that we, there is some state funding that comes to the district and how everything works and that we're not income-based for a reason because we do not want to reinforce the stereotype that every single person of color is low income. And that's very important to us, that diversity of experience for a person of color that you can meet someone that's equally a homeowner or lives in public housing, someone that went to college and didn't go to college, that is very important to me for people to see that we come in all shapes and forms. You know, so one of so that's one of the areas. The other areas is trying to find out how do we involve the um, the suburban families. To me, they're one of our biggest advocates. They are the ones that are putting into place our elected officials at the state house. They are the ones that have the voice of the people that have to put this line item in place. So I'm trying to figure out how to help them to organize locally so that they can create Friends of MECO program that will be the fundraising arm of the MECO program. Or um, another um, segment is the, the Family Exchange Program, formerly known as the Host Program. But I want to change it to the exchange because I want it to be equally beneficial for both families to come back and forth. In some of our And the Family Exchange Program is a way that it, as it would evolve, that, that suburban families would be able to have a special connection with one particular Metco student so that there was someone in town who they really feel like right. um, they knew and could look after them and could, you know, if something ran Correct. late, could help them in those kinds of things. But that also those suburban kids feel like they have a connection with a family in Boston who's probably from a different background, a different yeah, culture. Exactly and, that, you know, and that is one of the ways that our kids can feel like they're welcomed. If they have a house that they can go to, a friend that they can be with, they can participate in late sports in the school play. If if the night is too long, they can stay in their community. And then I'm trying to find intentional ways to bring the suburban families to Boston through a partnership that I have with Arts Emerson and the Boston, um, it's called the Boston Summer Arts Institute. They're giving me money to put together to actually invite families for plays that have to do around around race relations, followed by a dialogue and a reception. So those are like intentional ways to use social arts to really bring our communities together. But, you know, our districts do have, a few districts do have the Friends of MECO that fundraise and have the family host programs, but very few still have it in existence. In 
and some have never had it at all. So one of my goals is to create a blueprint for every district that wants to do this and wants to have a uniform way of implementation that they can that they can come to us and we can support them in that process. It's really interesting to hear you talk about it from this community perspective, because I think even for people who are living in communities that don't have an intentional desegregation program, don't have things like METCO, um, it sounds like part of your argument is that creating welcoming communities that support all of the diverse, creating welcoming schools that support all of the kids that are in there can in part begin by having community is organized around that goal to have, you know, whatever neighborhood you're in, whether it has METCO or not, Mm -hmm. um, to be able to say, you know, are there a group of us that are really committed as citizens, as participants and as families involved in the school system to make sure um, that our kids, that all of our kids feel really welcome and included in school? Yeah. And, you know, just last, just this week, um, two days ago, I was in Higgum at a school committee meeting where I got to present about the program. Following that meeting, like seven um, suburban parents came after me and all, and, and we started having a conversation. They said, we want to organize. We want to raise money for MECO. We want to advocate for the program. We want to start a family exchange program. And they were saying, but we've never done this in this community. How can you help us and support us? And I was so excited because that's exactly the kind of parents that we're trying to find because they will be the ones that continue living out the mission of the program program and ensuring that that suburban community never says no to the MECO program because until we have the uh, complete integration in these communities where there's interracial marriages, where there's, you know, the redlining this doesn't exist, you know, where there's housing that, that people could afford, then we can say, okay, we have we have, we have reached our goal, but we're not anywhere close to, uh, to accomplishing that right now. So, the, you know, so that's one of the things that I really want to do is help suburban families to feel like they own the program, that this, you know, takes some ownership and takes some responsibility for creating that welcoming environment because we don't own the houses there. We don't elect those elected officials. So you have to go to the people that have that kind of that kind of power and it's and it's the suburban families. Let's talk about inside the schools next, um, because that's another important constituency. So when teachers, when school administrators, when you're helping them go to the next level of work of going from you know, a, a base level of integration to a real kind of welcoming community. What work are you doing with administrators and teachers in school, in classrooms and extracurricular programs? What does that look like when it's happening really well or, or where, you know, where is it not happening well enough now that, that where you see room for growth and improvement? Yeah. So traditionally, the MECO office here in Boston, which I refer to now as a headquarters because we're trying to hold ourselves accountable to a higher level of support to our districts. We've been traditionally known as the referral base where people people come and apply and we refer to the districts. So a lot of the things that I'm working on right now are things that we have not done before from a central perspective. Maybe individual districts were doing this, but from a central perspective where we're pushing an agenda, this is something fairly new because I have a brand new team of people dedicated to different areas that we want to pursue. One of those areas is Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And her job, she started in January, so she's already been sought out by districts who want to do professional development around unconscious bias, you know, around how to have equitable practices, restorative justice. So she's been going around and doing that. We're having also our, our, our big conference um, this coming June, and then we're inviting strategically teachers teachers that can make an impact on what happens in the classroom and providing them this professional development opportunity. And we're also working on on our foundation that hopefully by the time this air, maybe by then this would already be a done deal who wants to support a cohort of teachers that we will identify that would apply into the MECO MECO teacher cohort program. And they would receive support for one year in terms of how how do they solve a problem that has to do with equity within their own classrooms. They will have to have permission from their principal and they have to have airtime in their school to ensure that what they're doing is not just impacting and affecting their classroom, but their whole entire school community. And what's your vision for what the what new practices might look like? So if I was a yes. teacher who is considering applying to the METCO teacher cohort program, um, you know, after I've completed that program, how will my classroom look different? How will my teaching look different? Sort of concretely, what are what would what would we be able to see teachers doing um, if they were taking actions that were getting us closer to what these welcoming classrooms might look like? Right. So, you know, one of the things would be at the curriculum, looking at the curriculum. I'll tell you from my own personal experience, I was frustrated for years as a parent that every single time we talked about the Spanish curriculum, we talked about Spain and Mexico. My own daughters challenged me and said, Mommy, I never 
over here about your country? You know, how come this is never something that we talk about in our in, in our language in our language courses? So that's something that. And your I, family's from the Dominican, Dominican Republic, Republic, which for listeners who are not in Boston, there are many, you know people might be familiar mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. some of Boston's famous Dominican um, mm-hmm. citizens, but there are lots Red of people Sox. from the yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the Red Sox players. But there's lots of people from the Dominican Republic mm-hmm. that um, that it should be into. You know, we would you know in a brighter future, all of the families in Eastern Massachusetts when they think like, oh, what Latin American countries do people from Boston come from? Well, they come from the Dominican Republic. Right, they come right. from Puerto Rico. They come from, you know. You know and, and when that was happening, I would really, I was frustrated, you know, because I wanted my children to be able to see themselves and their mother reflected in their curriculum. So number one is that the curriculum has to be reflective of the people that you serve, minimally. That the assignments that you give are not assignments that are not, in, you know, that, that, that are not um, discriminatory. There was another assignment also that had to do with defending slavery. So I found that to be very offensive. I was like, how are we telling our children to defend a moral dilemma? I said, we will never do this for the Holocaust. We'll never ask somebody to defend the Holocaust and give me the pros and cons. But yet we were doing it for the pros and cons of slavery. So, you know, in the classroom, I expect that the curriculum should be changing. It should be reflective of the people that are there. They should be able to see themselves there. And the story that's told should be a story that's be, that should be told, you know, from the, from the right lens. So I, you know, that and um, as, as well as discipline strategy in the classroom, a lot of the times our students of color right away, you know, um, have a different kind of discipline strategy than what we would do for a suburban student or a white student. So, I, you know, we want to implement restorative justice um, practices in all of our communities. And again, the big ones already have it um, because they're big districts. So they actually have a lot of funding to put into this. But the smaller communities are just trying to figure out, like, how do I do discipline strategies that are fair and equitable? And how do I not implement implement my own bias, you know, when it relates to this. And, and I expect could you to say also, a little bit more to define restorative justice? Maybe oh, yeah. not all of our listeners will. So, I mean, restorative justice is something that is, you know, becoming very popular, at least here in Massachusetts. And right now, the the institute that's doing the main training for that is Suffolk University. And what it is, is that whenever there's, there's a problem that has happened, that you create a circle and everybody gets to talk about how they felt and how what you said it did affected the other person. And the problem is not resolved until everybody feels like they've been heard and like the in and like the issue was addressed and basically whoever was hurt the other person has to do something to restore that relationship of pain that they've caused the other person so it also you know prevents a lot of suspensions you know and a lot of yeah a lot of you know more severe discipline strategies that our students of color especially boys tend to get that at higher rates than other students Restorative justice in, is one important piece. What are some of these other building blocks? So the other piece that I think is really important for the districts to work on is teacher diversity. I think if you are going to really um, embrace the MECO program and everything that it stands for, it also has to be representative in your classrooms. So we hope to see more teachers of color that people can truly identify with and also for students to be able to see that there are teachers out there that look different. I mean, in my own experience, my daughter didn't have a her first math teacher of color was in the sixth grade and I remember how excited she was when she first um, you know when she first was assigned to this teacher I remember walking into the classroom and seeing that she was a woman of color for my parent teacher conference I never knew she was a person of color and the first thing that I said when I walked in I was like oh my god you're a black woman and she was like is that a good or a bad thing <laughs> I go this is excellent I was like I am so happy because she was on maternity leave when, my, when the school year started so I didn't know who you know who the teacher was going to end up being so I you know I think that's another very important Important area that that we can look at um, for our students to feel welcomed. In your students' experience, in the in the experience of other Metco students who have really great experiences, can you think of what are the beyond choosing curriculum? What are the concrete practices that teachers do in their day to day improvisational interactions with students um, that are this kind of next level of work towards welcoming? What what does it look like when the what, you know who, who what are the actions that the very best Metco teachers take um, to make students feel like they're really they're, they're part of and they're co-creating the community. Yeah, so in, in that particular question, because I'm not at the, at, the, at the classroom level yet, except for my own experiences, I've been working mostly with administrators, you know, and with the school committee. Or can we can answer with administrators or school yeah. committee members too. 
What 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 are what are the administrators doing in buildings that really sort of make uh, that make a difference in classroom teaching? Mm-hmm. So you know one one of the things that I see many superintendents doing that I love is that when they were in terms of that in, that welcoming environment, they are really being intentional at saying these are our students. This is not the Mecca students. These are not the Boston students. These are our students who happen to reside in the city of Boston. So I've seen a lot of people begin to change how they refer to the program so that it doesn't feel like it's separate in the Distinct, but it is only it just whatever what changes is your residence. But we're still going to treat you the same. And I've been we have some a, kids who live on the north side of town. We have right. some kids who live on the south side of town. We have some kids who live in an adjacent town. I, I love it when I hear superintendents saying those are our children. We're going to do whatever we can to educate them and to, and to support them. So that that is something that I've been hearing a lot since I got in the job, and I've been really a, a, appreciative of that. The superintendents have also asked me for more professional development. They said their budgets have not allowed for a, enough professional development around diversity diversity, equity, and inclusion. They might do one big thing a year. So they're one of the things that they're asking of me, can you be the one to provide the additional support in between our own training so that our teachers are not just getting it once a year to check off the box that they've received, you know, that they have received that. And you've only been in the job for 16 months, but have you, and maybe you get these questions all the time, what do you feel like towns and districts outside of Boston, out, outside of the Metco area can learn from the Metco program? What, what could anybody who's, who's listening to this conversation say, um, you know, an important lesson from the story of Metco, an important thing that we have to share as an example to anyone, regardless of where they're living, what would some of those things be? I mean, I would say that nobody should be educated in isolation. And one, this is one of the messages that I'm trying to tell my own city, the city of Boston. Because, you know, whenever you have programs like this that take students out of the Boston public schools and brings them elsewhere, there's always some tension or some opinions about, you know, why are we doing this? But one of the things that I've told my own, that I've been beginning to tell my own community is like, listen, you have to be proud of this program. It was birthed out of the city. It's still alive 52 years. You are part of the solution of breaking down racism, stereotypes. You're creating friendships that wouldn't otherwise be form and who knows if you've impacted that 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 thought the thought and the thinking of that particular student because of that friendship and also we're preparing students of color to enter the workforce and be able to succeed and compete in a workforce that's majorly white because they've spent their whole entire life being educated around this community so we're building confidence we're creating them for you know for 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 jobs that are going to be competitive and those are the things that I think can happen out of out of out of an inclusive and integrated experience so that's why I think that the MECO program is in a position to become a national model. I mean, people already see us nationally, and, you know, when they always find us, and there's books and research and even a movie about us. But I think we need to make sure that we are recognized as a school integration program that is successful and something that is needed. And I've had other states already called me. I had St. Louis, and I've also had New Jersey um, spend some time with me to talk about how they can actually either start a MECO program in their own city because they see that isolate the the segregation is severe or someone that has an existing program that's facing out, they reached out to me to see how do we keep this alive. That's but great. I mean, I, I just I just love the mission of the program. I mean, it's not to me, it's not even about the conditions of the schools in Boston. It's about that is it's about the need to integrate communities and that we should be, you know, that this is breaking down racial tensions and racial barriers in a country right now where things are extremely tense. And those children will tell you um, that they have changed their mind about that particular group of people because of the friendship that they made. So I think this is a solution to having a better tomorrow. And I think that solution can be one that um, it took a particular form in Metco with busing, with city, suburban mm-hmm. relations. But one of the things that I really love from this conversation um, at may, you know, maybe it's the notion of those those Hingham parents could be parents in any community in the country who are asking themselves, we could be doing more in our community to be having a more integrated future. Like, what are the steps that we can take? I think if, if it doesn't require, um, it doesn't, you know, it's it's great if state officials in New Jersey or city officials in St. Louis can decide to do this work, but all of us can decide um, to make a commitment to try to create more inclusive schools and communities. Mm-hmm. And I mean, what I love about this is just how grassroots it is. This is something that parents are deciding, districts are deciding. So while the world tries to get everything together around racism in this country, we have a little bit of a solution happening right now. It's wonderful. Well, Millie Arbahe Thomas, thank you so much for coming to talk with us about thank the Metco you. program. <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure.